Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Geico of Mobile. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. This week's show is brought to us by our local Geico insurance office. Everybody knows Geico has great auto rates, but did you also know they have great rates on boats, ATVs, motorcycles, and personal watercraft? Give Ron Davis a call at 251-445-0053. Not only will Ron work hard to get you the lowest premium possible, but you'll have the service you expect and can count on if you ever need to make a claim. Geico does even more than ensure your valuable items. They also offer on-the-water services like towing, battery jumps, gas delivery, and you can save by bundling these services with your insurance. If you're an Alabama saltwater fisherman, support the local insurance agent who brings you the show each week. Call Ron Davis, Geico agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com forward slash mobile dash AL. I'm Butch Theory, and I'm joined today by my my good buddy, my fishing buddy, my trusty co-host, Captain Richard Rutland with Cold-Blooded Fishing. How are we doing today, Captain Richard? Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. How are we doing today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. Oh, man, what a weird show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just wish Joe Exotic was here to join us today. You on the Tiger King train? Is that what that's all about? Hey, well, maybe Carol Baskins will jump on here with us one day. Who knows, man? No. <laughs> I hope not. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> oh, man. We well, got uh, I don't know. I don't know how you mix tigers and fishing, but... Uh, hey, we like, can do whatever we want. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We got a good show this week. We got a great offshore report inshore and Chris Fetch has been smashing the pompano from the boat. I'm excited to hear from him. Uh, speaking of offshore, man, you guys had quite an adventure this weekend in your old 25 contender, huh? Tell me a little bit about Woo, that. Man, you ain't lying about that, man. We, That's some um, fresh sashimi in the bay boat, no? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's been fun. I feel I've been I've been feel like uh, if you were talking about tigers, I feel like a tiger. I've been just like grabbing hunks of tuna and <laughs> clawing onto it with my mouth. I got it coming out of my ears, trying to give it all away. But uh, yeah, man, we had a great uh, had a great great trip. Uh, was a just a huge I'd say milestone or whatever you want to call it for myself. Uh, ran out in the bay boat to the horseshoes and um, caught a real nice tuna, about 140 150 pound fish and we're on the rod for about three hours on just just short of three hours had a great crew i had my man triple c on the wheel Corey quint president of the alabama deep sea fishing rodeo this year did a great job driving the boat keeping me on top of the fish i was the angler i was the only person that could get a bite the whole time <laughs> we were out there imagine but that. i think it was yeah well, i think i thought that thought was kind of hilarious you know the first bite we got i mean, <laughs> you're gonna laugh the first fish we reeled in was a beeliner uh <laughs> i got a beeliner and then uh we broke a couple of fish off and then finally stuck a good one Corey did a great job driving the boat and we had my buddy uh uh david bryan out there who was with us everybody had a job everybody did it perfectly had a little help from our uh, another crew on another boat, uh, Gavin Busby and uh, John Pitt. Uh, John Pitt jumped on the boat uh, and uh, helped helped us gaff the fish. We were a little light on a gaff. Well, we needed two gaff guys on this fish, so uh, John Pitt. Oh yeah, John Pitt jumped on the boat and helped us out. Also, wanted to give another uh, shout out to uh, Southern Draw, um, uh, uh, Captain Coker. Uh, he gave us a couple of black fins kind of about them. And we, it was kind of a late bite, you know, that really fit. Everybody didn't start hooking up good until around like noon, one o'clock, something like that. I think we hooked up like about one thirty, two o'clock. Didn't get done fighting the fish till almost four, um, right. something like that. Somewhere right in there. Uh, I want to give a shout out to those guys for hooking us up with a little bait. It man. was slick, man. I saw some videos. It was beautiful. Oh, you, man. Guys must've, you guys must've got out there and got back pretty quick. Oh, for sure. We we averaged about like anywhere. We we ran for about an hour and a half in the dark uh, Saturday morning before the sun really came up. And we mm-hmm. averaged about like I, we were taking it easy, 34, 36 miles an hour. Once the sun came up, we bumped it up. We were over 40, 40 miles an hour, 45 some at some points, you know, and then uh, got out there real early. Got a little bit bumpy while we were fishing. Uh, I'd say maybe not the wind bumped up to maybe 12 knots or so. And then uh, by the time we got the fish in the boat, which was, you know, several hours later, it slicked off and we got back in. So in a hurry. Time Um, to roll. 
it was unbelievably slick in the Gulf on the way home. So, I mean, it was, and that's something, you know, a, a lot of people use the word crazy when they mm-hmm. uh, talk about what we went and did. Uh, but we paid real close attention to the weather. You know, uh, your, you know, your boat's in immaculate condition. Oh yeah. I take very good care of my boat, take very good care of my servicing and all Huge that. Deal. Huge deal. Oh, for sure. You got some uh, other boats I'm, with you. You got some chase boats, some buddy boats. Definitely. We're in, uh, definitely in contact with several people who were leaving from the island, going back to the island. And then, uh, the other thing too, that I, when I look at that forecast, it's not like I'll look at the forecast, like the, the, the night before I'm going and Hey, it's going to be good until the next evening. I like to see it be good into the next day. So right. <laughs> three reports out, you know, you always have like a, like a, an evening report, tomorrow report and tomorrow night report. And I like it to look good into three reports before I say, Hey, I'm going to run out there in my bay boat and go because I could tell you, you know, and of course I haven't had, I haven't caught in some really bad stuff, but, uh, it wouldn't be fun. quick. No, it wouldn't be fun traveling 80 miles in three to four foot seas in a 25 foot bay boat. That, that ain't how I'm going. It wouldn't be that fun, but that 25 contender can take it, man. I tell you what, I've been with you a couple of times in three or four foot, and I've been impressed. I've been impressed at how just tankish it is, you know, man. three foot chop running, you know, running pretty good. You're just bracing for that impact, you know, just to slam like a, you know, a, a regular boat, so to speak. And that thing just choom, 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 runs right. Yep. Man, they make a yep. It, it knives right through it, man. I can't, I can't say enough about the contender brand to how good a piece of equipment that I get to run out of, how good they are to me, uh, taking care of me and putting me in the position to be able to go and do things like this, That's right. uh, which which is unbelievable. They, uh, I I hope, I hope that our relationship continues for many, many, many years because the, the brand, the piece of equipment that I get to operate out of is unbelievable um, for sure it just, it, it's a ferrari it in my opinion to me i get excited to do you know i'm talking about i go get in a boat every day okay so go think about what you do for a job mm-hmm. all right and what you have to work with and what i get to go get in and, and go work in i get excited every single time that i put that boat in the water yeah i get yep. excited it makes my life so easy Got a fine office you get to go to every day for sure. Man, you're not lying about that. Well, man, that's a cool thing y'all did. Congratulations on that big tune. Congratulations to Corey and the guys that were involved in that. That's fun, man. Let's get into this deal. Where are we headed first? Man, uh, I think we're going to talk to Chris Vesey down at uh, Orange Beach at Sam's Bait and Stop. What'd you say, Chris? What's been going on over there in Orange Beach at the Sam's Bait and Tackle and wherever you've been fishing? I don't know. You never know what you're up to. I'm definitely kind of a nomad. It's been going really good, actually. Obviously, adjusting to the new norms around here, but you know everybody's fishing. That's for sure. The uh, yeah, I, been good. We had some. No, I just say I saw a lot, uh, some really really cool pictures. I'm actually excited to talk to you this week. I don't know if we're going to call this a, a surf report from the boat or a boat report in the surf. I'm not really sure, but uh, I'm curious to see. <laughs> curious to hear about what you've been up to, man. Primarily, the, the pompano bite has been red hot this week been on it's been a full moon cycle water temps are perfect conditions have been perfect fish you know fish have been going on the spawn this last week so the pompano bite's been about about as fast and furious as you could expect so i've been out on my skiff a lot uh you know over the last few days and at pompano bites be hard to say there's been much of a better one before but the numbers numbers have been incredible some big fish too i caught and I caught at least a few of them this week that were, you know, over four pounds. Uh, a lot of fish in that 17 to, you know, almost 19 inch range. What you said it's the perfect water temperature. What about is that on the beach right now? Um, it's still in the, uh, it's still kind of in the low 70s right now. So it's come up, it's come up quite a bit. And, you know, low 70 degree water, you know, that is, I mean, you have pompano. Spanish mackerel have been about as thick as fleas. I mean, you could go out any day and catch uh, plenty of Spanish. And then if you cobia, you know, there's been some cobia showing up this week. Yeah, I definitely want to ask you about that, too. I haven't been out personally looking for them just yet, but I've seen some really nice fish. There was a couple of fish over 70 pounds caught this week. My buddy Miles, uh, Tradition Charters over in Purdue Key, he went three for eight, I believe it was, a couple of days ago. 
So, I mean, there's fish coming down the beach. I think this next week, if we can get some decent weather, get some more eyes on the water, I think you're going to see a lot more fish being brought in. I've been twice myself, uh, and I, you know, we're, I'm way over on Dolphin Island, so I've just been running about kind of close to the, the pier or something like that. And then we had, like, a couple of days I went, I had some east wind. And uh, so I was just kind of riding that east wind back over towards the island. And uh, I was kind of trying to hang in that like 18 to 30, 35 foot of water range, moving Mm -hmm. down. And then every once in a while, I'd kind of go across that second sandbar in close to the beach. And I was just kind of zigzagging back and forth. Of course, I'm just trying to make it up. I haven't caught a lot of fish. Is that about I don't know. You got a tip for our listeners as far as uh, what water depth to stay at and whatnot, what to be looking for when they get out there? Honestly, with these migratory fish, I'd like to say that there is a preferred depth, but what you are doing is pretty much what a lot of us do. But I would say that on average, most fish are still being caught a little bit deeper. If I was going to go tomorrow, I would probably fish from about 20, 25 feet, moving all the way out to 35, 40 feet and zigzagging that little bit deeper uh, range of depth. I know a few fish for quite a week out as far, you know, 50, 55 feet. So some of these guys are looking a little bit further off the beach. But I think because it's still a little early in the season, too, there's not enough of a pattern established. But typically with that, uh, you know, these migratory fish, you almost never know. We Every year you're going to see at least a couple of them landed from the surf by guys fishing for pompano and redfish. And that's because those fish, they come in, you know, they're looking for food. They're migrating, you know, just along the beachfront. You almost never know. So like you said, zigzag in and out from the beach and keep your eyes open and bring more people with you. So we lose that many more eyes on the boat. Yep. Uh, we, got, we got real lucky. Well, I was, <laughs> I say we, I was by myself. I got real lucky and uh, ended up uh, popping two nice blackfish while I was out there too, you know. Luckily, I had a couple of live shrimp and a free line rigged up. Ended up catching two nice blackfish. So that was that was that was really neat as well. So they're they're definitely on the move up here as, as well, I think with the ling. I always keep a rod rig for triple tail during cubby season. Usually I just keep a DOA shrimp or something like that on there, but keeping a half a dozen to a dozen big live shrimp on hand is about the smartest thing you can do this time of year. Chris, I'm going to have to back you up. I don't think our listeners are going to be happy with that, uh, that Pompano report. He's saying how hot they were. We're going to have to, we're going to have to go a little deeper on that. I think, man, I'm also curious. No, we, to well, we kind of we jumped into the cubby thing a little, you know what I mean? We kind of, that's all right. I broke our own rhythm there. I take full <laughs> responsibility for that. <laughs> I was That's not right. gonna. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna blame you, <laughs> but I think we were already silently blaming you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So when Go you're ahead. fishing Pompano from a boat, I assume that you are pretty much fishing the same areas that you would fish from the beach. You're just you're you're angled a little different in your setup. I assume you're anchored. Just kind of walk me through it a little bit, man, because I have no idea what that looks like. Well, there's a couple of different ways you can go about it. I've actually, believe it or not, and this is going to sound stupid, but I've, I've actually trolled from, you know, off the beach for them before in my kayak. But usually if I'm on the skiff, you know, I'm going to look for the same things you look for during the day or from the beach, rather. You look for cuts, you look for washouts, you look for the same things. And the nice thing about the boat is I can position myself outside one of these areas. I can work it aggressively with both artificials and natural baits if I want to. And if there isn't fish there, instead of being on the beach where I'd have to, you know, walk around or all those fails, get my vehicle moved to another beach in the boat, I can just, I can run the beach until I see some I like. So there's actually a lot of advantages to it. Now, this week, of course, a lot of people have been huddled up around the rocks at uh, Perdido Pass because that, you know, that outflow, both on the incoming and outgoing tides, you know, there's been a, a, a good amount of fish there. But what we've done the last few mornings, what I've done on my skiff is, you know, I'll fish the rocks for a little bit on that deep bite. When it starts getting real crowded out there at the rocks or, you know, once they're kind of, you know, caught some decent fish there, I'll move out of that area. I'll move down the beach and I'll actually start fishing those pockets, you know, along those tools. And we're catching just as many fish. This week, I picked up a stowaway in Matthew Isbell. Um, <laughs> kind of invited, invited him on board because he was on another boat. And he said, just, I was like, yeah, just climb on. And we fished this one pocket of beach just east of, um, you know, around the East Jetty. And we ended up catching, not only did we catch a bunch of fish, you know, throughout a couple schools of fish that moved through. But, I mean, we caught fish up to, you know, probably a little over 20 inches and, you know, well over four pounds. And fishing nothing but artificial lures, keep in mind. No no natural baits. So you're seeing these fish come through. Are you, are you, and you're throwing the jigs at them. Are you 
You have set rigs drop We're down at, while you do that? No, no set rigs at all. And the thing is, is like the incoming tide, the incoming tide has been mostly in the afternoon. I've only been fishing mornings, which has been a falling tide. So the water's been a little dirty. So none of this is sight fishing at the moment, or at least on that outgoing, none of it's been sight fishing. Hmm. So you're just looking for those areas of water that are a little darker. You know, there's a little bit deeper pocket there. You're looking for areas where you can actually see that current turbulence because those are the areas that those fish are going to want to be in. And you bomb the jigs in there. Pompano, I know nobody likes to say this because it, I think they feel it takes something away from them, but pompano are jacks. They are a type of jack. They will eat artificial lures. And if they're there, especially in big spawning aggregates like we've been seeing, if you throw jigs in there and working fairly aggressively, you should be getting hit. And that's how it's been, you know, for the past week and a half is if the fish are there, you will get hit on the jigs. Let me ask you a question uh, on as far as uh, working your bait back in or when you say working aggressively, like are, are you reeling it as fast as you would for a Spanish mackerel trying to just reel, reel it as fast as you can or are you slowing it down and making bottom contact? Maybe walk us through that a little bit. Well, I'll kind of refer to, I remember one time we were talking about retreats and we always what you mean when you're talking about you know jig it and drop it or you know pick you know pop it and let it fall or whatever because that's different to everybody else and i've always gone by what i just referred to that one by one method one being your jigging motion and then the other part of it being your pause in between or your retrieve in between and what i do for pompano is i just do i do one hop of the rod and then just one turn of the handle one hop of the rod one turn of the handle and you're moving the rod about, you know, a foot to a foot and a half, but you're giving it a good hard pop. It's coming up, and then you're letting it drop while you, while you pick up the slack. If you can imagine that, it's a pretty sharp, fast retrieve. There's almost no pause in between besides that one turn of the handle to pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. So it's not a straight retrieve. It's, 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 you know, jig, 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 you know, and you keep that jig moving pretty aggressively. So maybe, so maybe almost just a, uh, just a taste slower than what you'd be doing with a topwater. Yeah, it's almost like working a topwater lure, you know, just a little bit, a little bit slower. That way you can let that jig fall, you know, a couple of feet in between. And the question I get asked the most here in the shop is, you know, well, what about when you're in deep water? If you work it like that, your jig isn't going to get down towards the bottom. I just adjust the, the weight of the jig itself. Mm -hmm. That way yeah. it'll still hold, it'll still hold depth and still keep that fast retrieve. And sure. I'll go up to jigs as heavy as one ounce. There's nothing wrong with going up to a pump that jig that heavy. They'll still hit it. Sweet man, that's a great report, man. It sounds like it sounds like the dead gun pop uh pompano is on fire right now. Pompano is popping off. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were supposed to have my pop stock tournament was supposed to be going on right now. Oh. And as of now I've got it kind of in a indefinite state of uh postponement. But it looks like, you know, with beaches and the um you know, the way they are, it doesn't look like they're gonna open by May. And if they do open by May, we'll have the tournament in May. If they don't open by May, then we'll unfortunately we'll probably have to cancel until next year. You maybe think about something. Um, Patrick Garmerson, uh, who's a contributor on here, I think you know Patrick. He uh, Pat found you know Pat's like all techie and everything. He's always finding the new greatest, and, <laughs> uh, latest and greatest uh, you know app or or uh, something on on the internet. And uh, oh, yeah. he he found something, man, where this app sent him a card, right? Like some type of little like credit card size deal. And you could actually run a tournament with this card, like, I guess, uh, through the, through the cloud, I guess. And you, you lay the fish down, you don't even need a measuring board or anything. You put this card in the picture and you take a picture of the fish and it kind of, it, it measures the fish somehow in relationship to this card. And so I don't yeah. know. Maybe that maybe that's the future of uh, what we're dealing with right now. If you got to put a tournament on, it might have to be an interactive thing. We can't show up and weigh up and see who's got the uh, the heaviest weigh in fish, but at least maybe uh, by by this measure, you could see who had the biggest one, and at least put something on, make it a little interesting for somebody. Because golly, we're just running out of things to do around here. So uh, yeah, you definitely got to be innovative with your approach to it, and. The only thing about the the reason that you know the problem with that even with the the pop of that tournament you know that we do is like right now we're still open you know our store sells gas we sell groceries we're considered an essential I could still take fish and weigh them here at the store the problem with the pop stomp though is beaches are closed 
And I'd say 90% of my participants are guys that fish from the beach that I'm sure, yeah. some of them might have boats, some have boats, but a lot of them don't. You know, the idea is, well, you could still have, you know, uh, have it from the piers or from the boats. Well, what that does at that point, though, is it forces a participant. He has to either find a ride or he has to pay to go on the pier or whatever. And it's just, I'd rather wait until everybody has that fair chance and has, sure. um, Even out the you know, has field. it open for everybody. Exactly. For exactly. Sure. Well, man, yeah. well, yeah, who knows what's going to happen with all that stuff. I'm allergic to even talking about it. So we're going to get that tip from you yeah. before we let you go. This week's onshore tip is brought to us by Fish Bites. Are you tired of scrambling for bait whenever you decide to go fishing? Have an artificial bait that's better than live bait ready to go at a moment's notice with Fish Bites. It's easy to pack and travel with, and it's shelf stable, and not to mention tough. With Fish Bites, the bite stays on the hook and the fish stay on the bait. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at, and tackle at fishbites.com. What you think for a tip this week, Chris? Tip for this week, since I mean, since we're talking about pomp or have you know been talking about pompano the most, why don't we stay on that topic for the tip? Obviously, this is going to be a boat tip. You know, even though it's surf fishing to a degree, it's still going to be a boat tip for those fishing pompano from the boat. The easy thing, and this isn't part of the tip, but you know, the easy thing lately has been to go to the pass, fish the rock. But if you go out there any given morning, you're going to see that it's not that easy because there are a lot of people. You know, by late morning, there are a lot of boats, there's kayaks, there's people on wave runners, there's all kinds of people piled in there. So if you don't have ideal positioning, you know, it forces you to look for plan B, which is to run those beaches. And the biggest thing I can tell any, the biggest tip I could give somebody run those beaches is cover water efficiently as far as when you find that, that rip, like we were talking about, you know, work it and, and move on. If you don't, if the fish aren't there, I mean, if the fish are there, you're going to find out pretty quick. Pompano are pretty active. They, you know, they move pretty fast. I'll pull up on one of those little potholes or troughs on the beach. I'll work it with my jigs pretty aggressively. And if I don't get bit, I move on. Now, I've seen some people this week anchor off the beach just trying to do that same thing. But they sit there and they sit there. And, you know, you talk to these same guys later. They're, you know, saying, well, we, you know, we caught a couple of them, but they just weren't biting. It's not that they're not biting. It's you, you got to move. You got to cover water and, you know, have confidence that, you know, if you, if you hit those spots, work them aggressively with those jigs, you're going to catch fish, but covering water is more importantly than anything. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why I like jig fishing for Pompano more than bait fishing is it allows me to cover water more effectively. Sit, you know, when you put baits out, you have to just let them sit there. You can't just keep reeling them in, throwing them out, reeling them in, throwing them out. You got to sit and you got to set. And when that happens is I'm spending more time in each spot. And if the fish aren't there, you know, you've wasted, you know, you've wasted three times as much time uh, as you would have if you're using artificials. So I would say that's my tip, you know, is cover water more effectively if you have to, you know, if you have to run the beaches looking for them. They're very active right now. They're very aggressive. You know, jig style, jig brand. I'm, I've been using a, a couple different jigs this week. I'm not going to get into throwing out names on which manufacturer, but pretty much any jig right now that's labeled a pompano jig half ounce uh, all the way up to even three quarter ounce something in pink orange yellow almost doesn't matter all of them are going to catch fish right now just work them aggressively and cover water i like that man. yeah man that's a great tip that's something i've definitely uh told people about speckled trout fishing uh man just you know get in make a hammer out a handful of cast if they're there they're gonna bite if they don't bite move on just run and gun yep, exactly you know, that's a great tip. I think that'll really help a lot of people go a long way. Hopefully this next coming week. And uh, hopefully like we're, we're talking about right behind this little front we're about to get, it's going to cool off just a hair and uh, should hopefully prolong this bite for everybody. It should. Now, I mean, it is like right now we're on, I think today. It's either it's today or yesterday. Was Today's the, the full yes. moon. Yeah. Going by my logs. I mean, usually you always, April, May, you always see a very big, peak in the bite on the full moons in april and may on that on that spawn hmm. so I, I think you're gonna see maybe a little bit of a slowdown i think the bite's gonna stay good but you might see a little slowdown over the next couple of days but as long as the water temperatures stay in this range we should still continue you know continue to have some good action on them but i would definitely look at the full moon next month and anticipate that we're going to have another good spawning aggregate so Awesome, man. Well, if people want to stop by there at uh, Sam's Bait and Tackle and get the rundown, get a new Pompano set up, get a new surf fishing set up, what's the best way to find you? We don't have an actual store website, so 
You can either visit us on Facebook, Sam Stop and Shop, and then of course call the store two five one nine one four two four five. Like I said, we are still open. We've kind of taken a little bit of measures to kind of you know make sure people are being somewhat safe, spacing out. We're trying not to let any kind of big aggregations into the store. Sure. But if you want to come by the store, we are still open seven days a week, five a.m. to nine p.m. two seven one two two Canal Road. So. We're still here. If you want to come in and talk shop, we can do it. Uh, don't be offended if I stay six feet away from you. That's right. No doubt. Wear your mask. <laughs> All right, Chris. We appreciate you being on, bud, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Desperate times call for desperate measures. If you can't fish from the beach, you got to figure out how to beach fish from somewhere else. You know what I mean? <laughs> man, it sounds like Chris is really on to something down there uh, on the beaches down there. Uh, sounds like there's a lot going on the beaches right now. Uh, Spanish mackerel are thick. Uh, Ling, Ling are starting to show up. Pompano bite on fire. Heck, I, I haven't caught 150 Pompano in my entire life, not much less than just one week. So, I haven't uh, caught 15 Pompano in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, where are we uh, headed next, man? Man, let's go down and uh, talk to uh, my good friend, my tournament partner, mentor, Captain Bobby Aberscott. How you doing, Bobcat? Man, I'm telling you what, I can't believe that 150 pompano. I'm like you guys, and I'm way older. I'm way older than both of you guys put together, and I ain't caught that many pompano in my life. I can tell you that. Good gracious, alive! You know, I'll tell you, that's a species of fish. I wish I I could get better at targeting because you know when we catch them, Rich. I mean, it's a blast to catch them, but our, it's a bycatch for us. You know, if you're out on the beach or, or or fishing, you know, the times I've caught them have been mainly fishing like up in the bay on and rigs and where we're bait fishing with with uh, shrimp. Man, I just love to. I, every time I catch one, I go, I got to get better at catching these. This is such a cool fish, you know. Well, yeah, we'll, uh, catch that well you need to listen uh, to the show this week. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely need to listen to the show because, uh, man, I tell you, uh, what uh, what Vessi was talking about really relate very well to what you and I do a lot uh, with the speckled trout fishing, you know, whole stick and move kind of thing. Uh, get in an area you like that looks good, work a lure, move along, you know what I mean? Go find another little area. Uh, they're catching all on jigs from the boat right now. Yep, all artificial, oh too. Gosh. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Now, now you're really getting me fired up. Oh, so, yeah. What's been happening in your neck of the woods, man? Uh, you've been you've been finding some fish. Well, I'll tell you something. It's been fabulous since probably I was on here last. You know, it's just continued to be great. I know the last time I was on here, we talked about how good it was getting. It it's only gotten better. The numbers of trout that I'm catching are just through the roof. I mean, you know, it's up fifty plus to triple digit days and being done by mid morning. Uh, and I'm still fishing all artificial bait. It's been the deal. And today, you know, Rich and I talked earlier. Today was the worst conditions I've fished probably this spring. We had just an awful wind direction with a lot of wind in it. And by the way, uh, I got, I need to just throw this out real quick. The guys I had, father and son I had today, Steve Young and Colby Young, I, I told me he's the regular listener of the podcast. So I told nice. him I'm going to plug you. If I, if, I, if I do the podcast this week, I'll plug you. So I told him, he's, I'm going to mention his name. But anyway, we fished today in some awful conditions. I told him last night, I said, guys, you don't want to go. It's going to be southwest. We're on the full moon nip. I mean, it's really going to be a tough day. And it's tough this time of year, Richard, I'll tell you, to turn down a trip. But we threw it together and, and really had a good day. I mean, it was a, you know, I told them I've had way worse days than this on what I thought were good conditions. And we had rotten conditions today. So if you're having good days on rotten, what I consider rotten conditions, that'll tell you how good it's been. Yeah, um, it's all doing a lot of voodoo fishing and, and gulp fish. I'm fishing some gulp shrimp under popping corks and voodoos under popping corks because there's reds and trout mixed in some, in some of the uh, creek mouse and stuff. So it's, you know, I've been putting both of those on there. And yesterday, the trip I had, we caught the biggest trout that we caught you know, all day. We're actually trying to targeting reds, getting up in a foot, foot and a half of water in some creek mouse with uh, gulps under popping corks. And I told the guy I had yesterday, I said, man, you know, this, I'm going to start doing, doing this for trout now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're up there trying to catch redfish and uh, catching our, our nicest trout in like literally, you know, foot, foot and a half of water. Uh, it's, it's good enough to where you can go out and play around a little bit with your presentation and where you're fishing and still continue to catch fish. On some of your better conditions days, when, when you don't have a bad wind direction or a lot of wind and stuff like you had to fish the uh, past day or so, are you doing anything other than fishing under a popping cork? A lot of people, you know, kind of like to fuss about fishing under a popping cork. And I say, I always tell people, and you'll be able, you'll, you can attest to this, being a fisherman for a living, I've made more money popping a cork than I've done <laughs> anything in my entire life. So I don't know why anybody would do anything different, but what else have you been doing other than 
and under a court. This time of year, top, that's the, the other thing that I'll always have tied on is a top water and a slick lure. And so if I get in a situation, and, and I'm doing air quotes here because people go like, well, I want to target bigger fish. Well, you know what? We got a 26 and a half inch trout Saturday on a voodoo under a popping cork at 10 30 in the morning <laughs> after throwing top water all morning so let me tell you awesome. something you know when they talk, uh, talk about that fishing that popping cork is not a big fish or a number side bait and you and i have won redfish tournaments <laughs> a number of redfish tournaments <laughs> fishing popping cork i can tell you something you ain't giving up nothing size wise especially in the spring and the fall That's but right. uh to, to direct to directly to answer your question this time of year, I have a top water and a slick tide on another, a couple other lures too. And those work well, but like even yesterday, we tried throwing top water and we caught, I don't know if we caught a couple fish the most in the first hour and a half, tri- switched over to popping corks and start catching, you know, nice fish, you know, and all of our nice fish came on it. So, but like you said, I, what I, when I think about the popping cork and, and you and I have done this in tournaments is I think about it as in case of emergency break glass and pull out the popping cork. Because if you have to catch fish, that thing's going to put some fish in the boat. I can't tell you this time of year and in the fall, but this time of year especially, you know, if you're in an area that like some of the marsh areas right now where the fish are really relating more to shrimp, even glass and that sort of thing, rather than bigger fin fish type of baits like they do during the winter, you're going to catch your fish on that. And I know some people just like Richard just said, you know, they're going like, well, I don't want to throw a popping cork. Well, you know what? You sit there and watch us catch fish then because it's, that's just what works. Man, you start fishing those on spinning rods with, with fairly light braid and, and fast action rods, There, it's still a lot of fun to do it. You know, it's still a lot of fun to do it. So Heck yeah, it gets to a point to where, you you know, if you, if you want to catch fish, you, you, sometimes you just have to do it. Heck, I, you've got the right, t- you put the right tack on there. And t- I'm not that crazy about fishing live bait under them, but I'll do it if I have to. But like this time of year when we're doing it all with artificial bait under them, shoot, I'm, I'm as good as anything. And it'll Sorry. outfish anything 10 to 1 or more this time of year. Yep, and it's fun too. Um, you All right, cool. So fun. we're 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 gonna say hashtag popping cork. All right, right. y'all put y'all <laughs> tie them on. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yep. That's All right, right. So you mentioned you've been catching fish around the creek mouths. Anything in the tidal rivers to speak of, or is, do you think the fish have moved out in the bay? Do you think the salinity is high enough I- for that yet? I don't think that bay. If you keep up with it, Barry just went under for the first time in probably three or four months. Wow. Just today just today went under flood. It's been in flood for three or four months, but when it gets under seven feet, the lower end of the bay starts to clear up. The areas around the shoals and the bridge start to clear up. And like Rich and I did back when Barry was still probably close to double digits, we went and fished some of the areas down towards the west end of Dolphin Island and caught trout. So, you know, when this starts getting around where it's at right now, which is six feet or so, and it's dropping like a rock, by the way, some of that lower end of the bay gets good. And then some of the areas around the eastern shore up towards the, you know, the Daphne, maybe not quite as far up as Daphne, but like the Fairhope area. And then down the western side of the bay, start to clear up quick. And those fish, I don't know if they're not, they're there all along and they're just in the deeper water, but they show up very quickly. Like like the fish we caught uh, down at the island a few, couple of weeks ago, they just show up quickly, you know? So mm-hmm. it's not going to be long before they're going to be out in the bay. As far as the tidal rivers go, I think there's resident fish, but I think some of those fish end up out in the bay. And so it's not going to be long that the fish that are moving in and out of the, those rivers start to completely move out of those rivers. It varies dropping out the way it continues to drop out the way it's doing right now. Mm-hmm. Last yeah, time I saw that, Yeah, it's at six feet. The reading I saw this morning, this afternoon, is about 6.3. So kind of got a light tide this week, it looks like. I would expect it to really, really clean up. The water to start to really clean up. And kind of like you're saying, Bobcat, I think there's going to be just fish are going to be showing up all over the place here before you know it. Yep. You know what I mean? It's going to be. Yep. All your favorite spots be, will be go-tos. Oh, yeah. It's going to be <laughs> full <laughs> on. Let's see, I was thinking it was all my favorite spots were go-tos like two weeks ago. You know, now it's really going to get crazy <laughs> uh, yeah. with this uh, getting this dirty water out of here, you know. That's been the thing that's really been the thorn in our side all winter is, is just how high the rivers have been. Oh, because yeah. we can battle, we can overcome anything except fresh water. Right. And um, that's what we've had to deal with. And right now, the uh, the upstate rivers are just, I mean, they're way, way, way below flood. And that's what influences the, you know, of course, the bay. If we don't get any, I'm, I'm knocking on wood right here. I'm trying to find some wood. <laughs> yeah. We don't get a bunch of rain upstate. Just, just use your hand. It's going to really 
it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's true. That's concrete. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if we don't get a bunch of upstate rain, man, this thing's going to shape up really good for you know just about the time that the trout fishing normally gets really, really. And it's already been really good, but it's going to get really, really good here towards the end of this month and into early May. That's awesome. Starting to fire me up a little bit, man. Last time I talked so, about and when, when have we ever had to have try to get you fired up about fishing, That's true. man? That's true. It's not <laughs> that difficult. Um, last time I talked to both of you guys, we were talking slicks. You seeing any more of that slick action? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, I was showing the guys today. You know, they were asking about that, and they because they've listened to the podcast, and I was mm-hmm. showing them what that looks like. You know, and we today we had some really nasty wind, and I was. It's it's kind of interesting what happens with those, and you and I'm sure we've talked about this, but what happens is not just seeing them, is understanding where the fish are in relation to the slicks. You know, we like today we had really heavy winds, and we were fishing out in the wind, and and when they got up, they start they get to the surface, they unshake and they break up real fast and they get blown away so you have to understand you know and then you get a day where you have maybe have light winds you know and they don't they just pretty much sit right over about where the fish are you know so you you really have to understand not just what you're looking at but where their fish are in relation to that and if you start to understand that that's how you start to catch them and that's what was working today you know is um when we'd see fish licks we'd um how to get set up on it and of Mm. course today it was one of those days richard you know what i'm talking about is when you're drifting up 15, 18 knot, and the slick always pops up, up current from you, and about 90 degrees to the boat. So there's no way to make a cast with a popping cork. They never pop up right in front of the drift, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what was happening. I'm going, there's a slick. You know, if we were 150 yards up that way, we'd be lined up perfect with it, you know? But anyway, the magic days are when you don't have enough, you don't have a whole lot of wind and they're a little bit in front of you and, and you can get the boat lined up with them and, and uh, start drifting into them. Hey, Bobcat, you're going to laugh at me when I tell you this, you know, but uh, just a little earlier on the show, we were talking about how uh, my crazy ass went offshore and caught a tuna in my bay boat uh but while we were out there man i kind of started hitting on some stuff with my electronics and sure enough i was looking upwind up current from us and i was seeing slicks in 200 foot of water offshore and uh and was setting up on them and uh and that you know that's kind of what got me on this this one little drift line that i kept doing over and over and over again and finally we uh we hooked up a handful of times and finally it hooked up and it stuck and uh we got a good fish but i promise you promise you i was seeing exactly what we see inshore uh on on some of these flats with these trout i was seeing offshore with these tuna man because we're in a big wad of boats there's like 70 boats out there and it wasn't like there was some boats upwind of me that were uh that were making slicks from their chum Chum, or anything like that no it wasn't any of that it was totally fish and you could smell them just the same way you could inshore man it was pretty neat man every and i say this all the time all fish slick, man. All fish slick. They do, yeah. man. They start eating. That, that's what happens. What were you doing? You were out there 200 feet of water and you were digging digging through your locker for a popping cork? Is that what you were doing? <laughs> hey, I bet that catch a tuna too. You know it. <laughs> yeah, man. Congratulations on that fish. That's pretty impressive. Uh, the, man, thank you. The guys I had on the boat with uh, with me today were talking about that. I said, yeah, that's when you know the trout bite's good when my man abandons the trout bite to go catch a tuna in a bait boat. <laughs> That's right. Wild hair. He got a wild hair. I did, man. Yeah, hey, yeah. Man. he's got a bunch of he's got a bunch of them on his head, oh, yeah. his face, and everything else. In his, in, his, in his head. I know, I know. I don't trust him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Captain Bob, you got the Hey Cap question this week, and this week's Hey Cap sponsor is Day Cool Heating and Air. As the saying goes, if you don't like the weather in South Alabama, wait 10 minutes because it's going to change. But one of the things that is predictable is the pricing at Day Cool Heating and Air. They offer flat rate pricing, and they don't charge for after hours calls. Let's face it, your HVAC always seems to act up whenever you need it the most. Don't get stuck between a rock and a hot place because it is heating up out there, if you guys haven't noticed. Daycool offers flat $45 service calls, $59 tune-ups, and they offer free estimates on equipment replacement. The pros at Daycool have been serving Mobile and Baldwin counties for over a decade. Contact them at 251-633-5121 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com or on the Daycool Heating and Air mobile app, license number AL07028. All right, Captain Bobby, this week's Hey Cap question comes from Lester Kirk. Lester Kirk asks, hey, Cap, is it true wind from the east fish bite the least in your experience? 
Put your seatbelt put your seatbelt on, uh, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't tell you this. That's the old fisherman saying, but we gotta say it down here down in South Alabama that if the wind from the east, the fish bite least, if the wind's from the west, they bite the worst, you know. <laughs> so I've always heard west is a, the beast or something like that. Yeah, it's terrible, man. I know, Butch, I know you the offshore guys, or mm-hmm. from what I gather, the offshore guys like the west wind. Man, it is just a killer down at the lower end of the bay. So there's probably something to that. I don't know if those old timers came up with that, but man, it is exactly opposite down in, in South Alabama. We and it could have a lot to do with with water clarity, but I mean, when I see W in any forecast, whether it be Southwest, which is what we had today, West, uh, Northwest, you can somewhat live with, but West Southwest is just a killer down there. And it's not—I don't know if it's so much that the fish don't bite, but it just destroys our water clarity. And if you're where you know trout fishing, particularly where you got a fish that's an ambush feeder and really relies on a sense of sight to feed, that that just kills the bite. You know, the, even the old timers, and I'm an old timer, and these are guys older than me, used to say they wouldn't even leave the house if it was blown out of the west or southwest you know just because it would shut everything down you know so i don't you know it's so to answer his question directly if they bite least i, I east is our is our is my it, something with east in it is what i really like to fish you know so i i look forward to getting that we get that a lot in the spring by the way is typically we get uh, unless it's pre-front, like which where we're at right now, but typically we get a lot of east and southeast, northeast winds. That is to us, to me, is where they really, where the fishing really gets good. And it's got probably got as much to do with water clarity as anything else. But as far as trout fishing down in South Alabama, I have to totally disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, we always well, said offshore. No. I remember what it is now. East is the beast, and west is the best. That's what we used to say offshore. Man, that's, yeah. that's funny. That's funny because because uh, you know, Cap Bobby and I, we we seem to ask each other the same questions or thinking the same things a lot of times when it comes to what we're doing. And uh, man, well, any time that we see that east, east anything, you know, northeast, straight east, southeast, it don't matter how hard it's blowing. Uh, in one of those directions, it, there is a lot, a lot of doors that open up for us on an east wind. And I, I just get tickled when I see anything east. And when we see, and like we were talking about earlier, I always tell everybody anything west is the kiss of death. You know what I mean? Absolutely the kiss of death. Yeah. And I don't, and, and, and that's something Bob, Bobby and I have like, talked about a lot uh, together over the years is, uh, is why is it that when the when it blows out of the west and it doesn't even have to blow out of the west a whole lot that the fish turn off or that the water gets extremely dirty it could be blowing the same the same the same out of the east somewhere and the water stays clean for some reason it just it hmm. it blows my mind I, I don't know why but it's yeah. got to be something to do with that current in the Mississippi Sound and the in the wind direction, but that east wind opens so many doors, and a lot of people really that they really they believe that old timer story of that you know wind from the east, fish bite the least, and that man, I get I jump up and down excited for an east wind. Yeah. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we got some guys, and I'm sure there's we got plenty of listeners on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay that are that are going like, yep, 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 they're right. Yeah. <laughs> you get away from that eastern that eastern shore of Mobile Bay, those guys go like. Oh man, I don't even want to get out of bed, you know, but, but it is nuts. I mean, and it can literally happen almost overnight, even in the places that normally hold clear water, you get, it starts blowing double digits, you know, West, Southwest in the morning, by the time the morning comes around, everything's trashed, you know? Absolutely. Cool. All right, Bobby, we appreciate that. Hey, cap question. Uh, Lester Kirk is going to get a prize pack from the slick lure. Lester, make sure you email us at the best fishing report.com to redeem your slick lures. Y'all send us hay cap questions there or follow our Facebook page and submit it that way to get in the runner for the slick lure prize bag. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Let Lester me ask you the question. How come, when, when does the, uh, how come the, uh, how come the uh, guy that answers the hat, hat, hay cap question doesn't get a pet prize pack too? I think we need to <laughs> institute that. Book. Just, how come we can't get I think I'm lobbying up. for some slick lures, man. Take that up with <laughs> Captain Landry. No, that's, the, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we appreciate you, Captain uh, That's a great report, man. That's a great hit cap question, Lester. We appreciate that. And we'll talk to you soon, Captain Bobby. Keep whacking them. All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Always great to hear from the Marshall of Mississippi Sound, Captain Richard. <laughs> man. Well, the my, fav- my favorite. 
All right, man. I never thought I'd be kind of grouping you with this group, but let's uh let's go talk down to offshore, Captain Dustin Beggood. Maybe you guys can swap some notes on tuna killing. What you say, Captain Dustin? Hey guys, how are y'all doing? Man, we all right, buddy. Just trying Pretty to Pretty good. We're just uh we're just fed up, man. What you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm fed up too. Hell uh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> what you been up to man what you been doing you've been sword fishing tuna fishing i've been chasing tuna still I'm seems really, to be I'm the name of the game right now words. everybody's still got the tunas on their mind they're getting they're seeing a lot of pictures of everybody else catching them so they're still mm-hmm. wanting to go after them it's hard to talk somebody into sitting there sword fishing when you know tuna bite's been good but we uh we tried to do some different stuff this week uh i tried to go and chase more of a numbers not you know those big fish it's a long Spent a few days out of the floaters, you know, fishing in some blue water. Not not looking for those bigger grade of fish, but you know, thirty, forty to sixty pound fish makes a lot a lot of fun for oh, and a lot lighter tackle. You know, you can take some not so experienced fishermen out and let them catch those fish on lighter tackle. Hang on a second. So you mean there's tuna out there they don't take three hours to catch? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, all right. You I was know, just checking. I was just checking. Yeah, it's a, a, it's, a it's more of a twenty minute fight or a, uh you know, a twenty or thirty minute fight on real light tackle. If you were using the same tackle that you're using at the long, you know, the fifty wide or the thirty, you know, it would be ten minute fight, not even not even that, you know, probably five. But they're a lot of fun and you know, I had some ladies that went with us and they enjoyed fighting those fish instead of being strapped into a belt for a long time fighting a big one. Yeah. And it really gets everybody on the boat a little more it gets them their own fish instead of, you know, everybody on the boat fighting one fish, which has been happening for the last few weeks. A lot of uh swapping it back and forth, you know, just because everybody gets wore out from the fish. But I was ready for a change. I'd I'd been to that lump so much and I went on I guess it was Thursday. I went to the lump, and it was a lot of action, kings and bonitas and everything. But we didn't, you know, we saw some other boats catch some tunas, but we didn't catch one. And it was just a long day out there. The next day, I made the decision that I was not doing that again, and it paid off. I think we had six or seven fish in an hour, and the customer actually got sick. And he said he he told me he was he wanted to go in the end, and we already had. I think it was we kept we had five in the box, and you know. I, I was sorry that he was sick, but I was definitely glad to go in and have an early day. Yeah, um, for sure. Get back, well, uh, you know, get back I, at lunchtime. It's interesting you say that about uh, about making a transition away from the what I would call the inshore, mm-hmm. closer in coastal stuff. That's that it's typical of this springtime, you know, catching those uh, these bigger fish in shallower, and then transitioning to the offshore side. Because uh, one thing I noticed, you know, of course I've been out there twice in about the uh, past three weeks. I noticed the bite cleaned up a lot at the. Uh, I could tell something was different at the at the uh, at the horseshoe lump. We didn't get near the sharks or the bonita or the king mackerel or any of that kind of stuff out there. It was the bite has cleaned up a lot. Of course, we didn't get that many bites. Of course, the ones we got were really good. So yeah, like you said, I I think I think I think right now, you know, if you want more action, things are moving out in the deeper water. If you want to still try to catch a giant i think being on the closer in shallower water is is where you want to be so just you know, no matter what you want to do right now i believe yeah and they're catching a lot of blue marlin you know it just seemed like everybody that went out on orange beach last week you know they caught one or two blue marlins you know a lot of tuna were caught and blue marlins i didn't see any dolphin really yet maybe a few small ones but uh, a lot of big fish being caught you know offshore too so you know i had some friends catch a 190 on the troll, you know, that's that's a big fish offshore. But the inshore bite still been good. The problem I had is kinda of like what you're saying, there wasn't a lot of bycatch bite, not a lot of bonitas and stuff. And I and, you know, the way I fish, I really need those bonitas to be able to chum because I go through, you know, a couple flats of pogies real quick. And those fish have seen so many pogies. If you have the red meat, that's the big difference. And if you can't catch the bonitas on the out there, you know, you need to provide the one day that we had better success on the lump. We actually went offshore first, caught some smaller fish, and caught a bunch of you know black fins and some bonitas. And then we had something to actually chunk with, and didn't have to worry about running through pogies real quick and trying to catch bait. And it was a lot more successful that day. You guys are going over to the east a little bit more in the, those stumps. I guess you're talking about the one straight south of Dolphin Island, a little bit deeper water. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. It's a little deeper out there. It's off the side of the shelf. It's in you know, beautiful blue water. The lumps, you know, some days you catch it, it's in blue water, but those rigs out there are really blue. I mean, the water is blue all the way into the shelf, and, you know, that's a different experience for the that's customer. pretty close too. in for right now. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's not that far. Um, I know on Saturday, Patronus and all, was it, it was blue there. Sure, there was some yellow fan caught there. Um, I didn't actually stop. I run a little bit further out and then turned over and run to the west and did a little deep drop. And I had also, you know, this, it seemed like the grouper bite was really good the last you know, four or five days. Um, we, you know, we we spent a little bit of time and caught a snowy and we caught some uh, tile fish. That's really what we were trying to catch. But I had friends that that really on Friday they they caught, you know, they had a boat limit of snowies, and so that's that's something awesome. we really like to do with the customers too. Yeah. I mean, I haven't got into it much yet, but we're about to be there. Yeah, I know we got a lot of listeners that do that too. Let's talk about that a little bit since we're there. You guys, uh, you, you focusing in on like the, the mud flats and the mud holes or you finding more rocks to be more productive? Um, It depends if you're looking for the, you know, if, if you find a rock on the mud bottom, you can catch your groupers off of it and then maybe catch your uh, top fish as you're dragging it up the hill a little bit. I like to find some, you know, where it's, going up on the ledge sure. and drag my baits up that ledge uh, to catch the tile fish and i'm not a great grouper fisherman but you can still be productive if you're if you're drifting along drifting up the ridge catching tile fish and you catch a grouper you just mark that spot and go back and hold mm-hmm. up over it and catch the groupers until they quit biting and then go back to drifting live bait to deal with that you know squid uh cut pogies uh, red meat is one of my, you know, I prefer red meat. Bonita's cut up, you know, in chunks on uh, chicken rigs. But I also mm-hmm. like to, uh, I-, I like to mix it up, put a couple of different kinds of bait, put a, use, run a couple of lines with lights and maybe one with not and see what's getting bit. There's a certain light that's getting bit more, whether it's a strobe light versus just a regular glow stick. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes that'll make the difference. You change everything, you get everybody fishing the same way you can really start catching them. It doesn't take long to, you know, have your, you know, have a, have a boat full of fish. I'm not, as I say, I'm not that great at it, but you know, some of these guys that are really good group of fishermen, when you go deep drop them with them, you pull up to a spot and you make a drop and you have five hooks, you bring five fish in. Oh yeah. You know, five groupers at a time. So you're done quick. I wish I could say I do that all the time, but that's not the case. <laughs> that's all right. Um, and I think it's, well, I think it's more uh, boat control for those guys. They can hold it up really good over those spots. For sure. What do you think as far as water depth goes before you start playing with those lights and stuff that you get into? I usually try a light anytime I'm fishing in, you know, 400 foot of water or more. I may not start out with a light, but if I'm not getting bit the way I think I should, I'll go ahead and put a light on <laughs> just to try it. Uh, and, you know, if I have four people fishing, I have one with a light, you know, one without, and I'll swap it up. And they, if those fish all jump on one, you know, one line, you know, they're all fishing. You know, once they drop to the bottom, they're all going to be pretty close together. All the fish jump on one, you know, one side of the boat on you know, one certain set of baits, and you know, to switch everything over to that. For sure, yeah. that's the deal. Um, yeah. There's some lights that I stay away from. Maybe the I, I, for some reason I don't like the reds. I like the whites and blues and just a glowing green light. But you see people do all different kinds of stuff. Never know what's going to happen when you go out that far. Um, That's right. That's right. Hey, so uh, so backing up a little bit, uh, back to our tuna tuna fishing and uh, maybe uh, just the offshore stuff instead of the deep dropping thing. When you're uh, talking about getting away from the lump, because it sounds like, it sounds like the lump is kind of a definitely a chunking deal right now, catching those big tunas. Uh, is that what you're doing out around the rigs and stuff like that too? That are kind of like straight I'm, south of the island. You can chunk out there and be very successful. Um, you know, especially catch your bigger fish. If I I like to go out there and I always like to carry live bait with me. I like to catch cigar minnows or um, some you know some speedy bait. I don't you know I like a pogey, but by the time you catch a pogey and run 100 miles offshore, 80 miles offshore, he's not in the greatest condition. He's red faced. He's been beat up. He's not swimming real fast. I like something. I like a more of a speedo bait, you know, a cigar mm-hmm. or something. And I like to be able to catch him on a sabiki so I can uh, de-hook him and not handle him and hurt the bait. Uh, I try to take real good care of him when you sabiki him. And, you know, I, I like to catch a bunch of them. You know, I like to catch 100, 150 or more. So if I want to catch five or six fish, I have 10 or 15 baits that I can throw out live chum with 
before I throw my my hook baits out to get those fish feeding. If I have 50 baits and I pull up and I throw 15 of them in the water, my customers are looking at me like I'm crazy um, <laughs> for throwing, you know, ha- all the chance of our bait away, yeah. you know, just to see if I can get the fish to come up on the screen. But if you throw 10 baits out and they start coming up and eating them, and you and you just continue to feed them. It's not going to be long, and you're going to have you know, you're going to have several tuners in the boat. You can you know get to doing that, and there'll be some really big fish that come up and eat too. So for sure, I saw a couple guys that did pretty well on a kite. That's that's, that's what I like, man. I love putting that kite up. There's nothing like a kite yeah, with a big tuna, man. I love it. Yeah, I really like it, but that is you know you have to have some experience on the boat with you. Um, for sure, your deck you can't have to be your deck can has to be fairly experienced with flying that kite. And I, you know, there's some people in our bill staff. I every, I every time I see him, I'm sure he's flying the kite. You know, he's very successful with it. I I'm not that good. We do it some, but it's a lot to do. You know, to run the boat, fly the kite, and manage the rods. But sometimes it, it's the difference. Yeah. Sometimes it can re- you can really get bit on it. And what's good about the kite is you can use as heavy a tackle as you want because the bait's out of the water and they eat it. Yeah, sure. I think uh, um, I think you hit the nail on the head when, you, when when the kite subject came up. You said experience on the boat mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. Uh, the experience on the boat is you as the captain, and I think with a kite, you had the the, the positioning of the boat is very 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 important. You know what I mean? You can't mm-hmm. be drifting around all over the place. You got yeah. you got to be able to stay held up right in the same place, you know, and uh, be kind of doing your thing before you're going to get a bite on a kite like that because – You've got to have a couple guys working the working the kite, one guy working right. the rock, one guy working the kite. And if I carry a group of my friends out there, of course, yeah, we can put the kite out. And, you know, they can manage the rods and the kite rods. You know, yep. we usually keep it on – we usually put it on a Tanacom so it's electric so it's easy to retrieve the kite. But you still have to have somebody there managing those reels to keep the baits just on the surface because if they're down three or four foot under the water, I, don't, I think you're defeating the purpose of a uh, 100% agree. Kite. Yep. Um, oh, there's definitely an art to it. I've gotten pretty good at it. Me and yeah. Skipper on the escape, we can smash them. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely effective. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, man, that's a great report. we got to get that offshore tip from you. This week's offshore tip is brought to us by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. A great way to support conservation projects like the Quad Petite Flounder and Speckled Trout Hatchery in the University of South Alabama Cobia Tagging Project is the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama Saltwater Fishing License Plate. Just head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's Distinctive License Plate page at revenue.alabama.gov to get yours. What you think for an offshore tip this week, Captain Dustin? My tip this week is, uh, you know, if you want to go out to the floaters and, uh, be, you know, have a, you know, have the best chance to catch fish, is uh, spend your time inshore once it gets daylight, catch as much bait as you can. I mean, you, you never want to run out of bait, but, you know, catch you 100, 150 of those cigar minutes and keep them real fresh and take them out there. Even if you feel like you're running late, you can go ahead and spend that extra time and get them because if you get out there and don't have them, you know, you're going to wish you did when you could have just spent that extra 20 to 30 minutes catching them and taking care of them. Don't, uh, you know, don't be unhooking them with your hand. Make sure you use the hooker, drop them straight in the water and don't yep. handle them a lot. Keep those baits good and speedy. That's a great tip, man. I love those. Um, I don't know, even know. I think they're called Spanish sardines is their actual real name. Those green, oh, back, yeah. those green backs, we call yeah. them tuna, tuna crack. Oh yeah. And so, you know, you'll catch the sardines, the, and they're more of the, there's a couple of different fish you catch. Is the, you know, you catch some that are more of a scaly, round scale fish. They're not as hardy as those cigar mm-hmm. minnows. Those cigar minnows, we can take them out there for a couple of days and they'll still be swimming good in the live well. And we, you know, we'll put them in a pen when we get back and carry them, you know, carry them a couple of days. Most of anything else we carry guys. The hard yeah. shells will live, but other than that, everything else. Even if it's not dead, and you pull up to a rig and you throw him out and he's half swimming on his side. That's no good. You know, it, it is no good. If the yeah. bite is not just going off, you can just hang it up. Hey, uh, just using for a chunk bait. Hey, Dustin, on your um, on your live well systems, are you guys uh, using anything like these uh, Venturi systems and stuff like that to like uh, to to blow the bubbles into your live well and whatnot and keep them even more lively than? I mean, there's a zillion different tricks you can do on your live well, you know, like whether you put like a bubble machine in there that's blowing bubbles. That's what all of us inshore guys do with our shrimp and croakers and stuff like that. But some of these guys I see going offshore will put these Venturi systems in there where it's sucking air in. 
as you're blowing raw water into your live wells uh, it makes these beautiful bubbles inside you doing yeah and we, you, we're where we're running a sea chest on everything keep you know you always have plenty of flow to your fish i have aerator on on both boats we have aerators that we can turn on but really only use that if we're using the floor box or if we're carrying pokies well we'll put fresh we'll put the water we you know when we catch those fish we'll put that water in and just keep recirculating and aerating it instead of putting that higher salinity water on them and killing them but it most of the time we're just running the uh sea chest um, just uh, a lot okay. Of uh, okay. So, so like with your sardines and your cigar minnows and stuff like that, you're running wa- raw water over them uh, versus like That's right. w- with pogies, you're trying to you're trying to maintain that salinity that you caught them in. That's <laughs> that's, that's right. Good, yeah, that's a that's a good trick right there, man. I I I think uh, I think a lot of people probably wonder why they run way offshore with a bunch of live pogies and they're dead as hammers when they get way yep. out there yep that's a great yeah tip i think itself. they just get out there in that higher salinity water and it just you know it chokes them all right yeah, um, sure. but if you, can, if you can keep that boat yeah if you can keep it that same water and they're recirculating i think you'll have better success Sweet, awesome man. man yeah that's a great report we appreciate it captain dustin if somebody wants to book a trip with you on your boat or yeah i know you do some stuff where you take people on their boats what's the best way to get in contact yeah, with great. you um the best way to get in touch with me is uh 251 Seven one three five. All right, fedupcharters.com. Richard and I were just talking. He wants to um he wants to catch a swordfish on his twenty five foot contender next. So we might have to. Oh yeah, he's got it. He he can do it if he if he what he did you know by going to the lump. It's, I think it's much easier to make that trip to catch the swordfish. I might have to be involved. He can in do that. it for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it, it you know it, it once he tries it a couple of times, it won't take him long to figure it out. A fishy person will figure it out pretty quick. Sweet man. All right, Captain Dustin, we appreciate the report as always, buddy, and we'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, man. You no, know, we got to wrap this thing up with what did you learn today? In this week's what did you learn today is brought to us by Advanced Transmission. Towing a boat is an important part of having a great day on the water for many anglers. Are you sure your transmission is up to the task? Get your transmission checked out in service before you tow your boat this season at Advanced Transmission in Spanish Ford, Alabama. They install external transmission coolers for those who engage in regular towing to keep the most expensive and complicated part of your vehicle running smoothly. Advanced Transmission has well over 300 certified customer reviews with a 97.8% satisfaction rating. So you know they'll take care of you. Give them a call at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. Be sure to tell them you heard them on the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report for a 10% discount. Man. Great show this week. For sure. Golly. What was your favorite part there, Butch? Man, just kind of stepping out of comfort zones kind of deal. I think the catching the pot or not catching smashing the pompano from a boat is a pretty cool deal man bet you i really really uh was very in depth on that and like i said i think i think it was a couple three weeks ago we had a gentleman that asked us a hey cap question about catching pompano from the boat so i hope he likes that segment hopefully it helps him out um i know you and bobby were talking about it's just not something that we do from a boat very often no so, so no, to not to hear somebody analyze that and be scientific about it and tell you how to set up and what to catch, that's kind of a game changer, especially right now in the predicament that we're in. For sure. Uh, I would tell you, I'll say my experience with the Pompano has been usually when I catch one, I usually catch three or four or yeah. five. I mean, and five is like, that's like an epic high, slap and high fives, uh, mm-hmm. kind of it, one of these crazy things like you caught a, caught a unicorn or something when you catch four yeah. or five of them you know but it usually is very quick bam 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 and it's like it's exactly what what chris was talking about you get in some areas uh that look good make a couple of hammer out a couple of really good casts if patrick's talked about this in the past with something uh that i want to say uh mike iconelli's talked about uh mm-hmm. in some of his podcasts and stuff you get in a good area that looks fishy Hammer out ten good solid cast. If you don't get a bite, move, move on. Move on. You know what I mean? That sounds like exactly what Chris is talking about. Yep. Get in a good little area where you see like two sandbars that meet up and there's a little washout between there. Fan cast all around that whole area. Don't get a bite. Boom. Moving. Going. We're going Stick to find move. The next. That's it. And uh man, that's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So what'd you that, learn? What'd you learn? 
Man, I tell you what I learned is just listening to everybody talk and uh, what I've what the little bit I've experienced here lately is man, it's just it's time to go fishing. It's all it's uh, it's springtime. Yep. There's a lot of different a uh, lot of different species out there to go catch, and you're never gonna know what's what you're gonna bump into until you go. So yep. I would just say I would just say go fishing. Get your bait right. It sounds like get yep. you know get your ideal bait. Take time. If it takes you a little longer and you get a little annoyed, well. Yep it's going to be worth the time you miss fishing to have that good bait. I guarantee that's it. it. Yep. And, uh, I experienced that when I went on my, uh, uh my offshore adventure, uh, Dustin's talking about that as well. <laughs> offshore adventure. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin's talking about that with, uh, with catching his live bait when he's doing his deal with the floaters yep. and then Captain Bobby being the shallow water stuff, catching speckled trout. He's doing all his stuff on artificial. And so yep. is Chris, you know, so, I just think the fish are on the chew right now. You know, we're coming off this full moon, which definitely usually is the start of spring, April mm. full moon. Uh, it's an exciting time right now. It is, man. Everything's kind of firing off. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Need to get out there and catch something for sure. Man, hopefully you folks out there this week will uh, put it to good use. Uh, get out there. Let's go catch something. It. Tug it's is the, the drug. Tug is a drug. <laughs> All right, folks. That's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com forward slash ASFR, and we'll send you the new show each week. Also, we'd love for you guys to go on iTunes. Uh, you go on iTunes, go to our show, and you scroll down and leave us a review. That helps a lot on our iTunes rankings. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you guys soon. You guys keep whacking them. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by the Floribama Fishing Rodeo. The funnest fishing tournament on the Gulf Coast is June 12th through the 14th. Go to fishflorabama.com for tickets and more details. And also, Killer Doc. Are you suffering from dock dysfunction? Check out a full line of dock enhancement at killerdoc.com. That's killerdoc.com. Also brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Did you know you could save up to 40% on your homeowner's insurance with a fortified roof? Learn more at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-973-9999. Also brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea tips, altimetry, currents, and water color at hiltonsoffshore.com. Also brought to you by MDH Foundation Repair. If your home was experiencing foundation problems, MDH Foundation Repair has the best solutions to fix it right and fix it now and protect your most important asset, your home. Check them out at mdhfoundationrepair.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baya, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timberland, farmland, recreational land like hunting land, or even agricultural land or ranch land like horse farm, drop me a message at jbaya at nationalland.com. That's J-B-A-Y-A at nationalland.com.